You're never going to always feel great when you're racing, but it doesn't mean you can't find something and end up having a good run. A lot of the time it's just mind over matter and you have to stop your head from thinking these negative thoughts. Once you realise you can overcome that, then you should end up having some pretty consistent performances. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running for Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, whose first ever email was Sporty Freak 100, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to this bonus episode of Running for Real. Thank you so much for being here today. And because of the generosity of my Patreon supporters, I get to bring you one extra episode each month, which means you get extra advice, extra motivation, and an extra hour of listening. If you would like to help me reach my next goal on Patreon, which will mean live in-person shows, and if you appreciate all that I do for this podcast and everything else, you can find out more through the show notes or by visiting patreon.com forward slash running for real. Thank you so much in advance to anyone who does go on to support me and who already does. Now, today I thought we would dig maybe a little bit deeper into the shorter or more accurately the middle distance of friend, uh, events Excuse me, with my friend Jake Whiteman. I have absolutely loved watching Jake come along in his career and I'm sure he has even more exciting accomplishments up ahead. He's run 144 in the 800, 333 in the 1500 and if you couldn't tell already he has some serious wheels. If you recognize his name but you are a US um, listener Maybe it's because he won the New Balance uh, Fifth Avenue Mile this year. Bit of a um, surprise for, for some, but, you know, as you will hear this year, the goal was to win and, and he went and did it. Jake is not just fast, though. He's really humble and he's happy to pass on his advice to help us and, you know, to help all runners all across the board, which we'll hear about. A lot of what we talk about today is focused on middle distance races, but you can easily apply it to your own, tra- own training, no matter what you're training for. So I kind of, you know, bring up that during the interview, reminding you of where you can apply it to yourself. So hopefully you still enjoy this one, even if you don't have any intentions of running anything short. So if you're ready, I have one more thing to tell you before we get on to the interview. Now you subscribe to Running For Real through your favorite podcast player, you might find yourself occasionally skipping an episode. Don't worry, I know you do. We can still be friends. And I know that not every episode is going to be something you're interested in or you want to learn more about. But if you do have an interest in a particular topic, rather than searching through the minefield of podcasts to find one that may discuss your topic, and then maybe it's just that they put that keyword in there just to get in rankings, I thought I would make it nice and easy for you by creating six podcast series, each on a topic I know runners want to learn about. If you have a marathon coming up in the spring, maybe you want to start doing your homework now to make sure you're ready when training begins. Or maybe you just did a marathon and your goal race was recently and you noticed that you really struggled mentally. Or maybe you found yourself giving up and feeling frustrated with your time or your place. Or maybe you're at a different point in your life and you're about to start trying for a family and you'd love to keep running a part of your life, especially once you become pregnant and once you have the baby, but it can be a little bit overwhelming and maybe you feel a bit lost as to what's okay to do and what's not. So I made each of these topics into their own series in addition to three other topics I'll discuss another day. In each one, you'll get six to seven episodes of interviews with some of the best experts in the world. They give this actionable advice on how to prepare for the next marathon, how to make yourself mentally ready, or how you can know what you can and can't do as you begin your adventure as parents. You can find out more about the podcast series through the show notes or at tinamuir.com and go to the podcast heading. You'll find them there. Jake, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast, another person at your first podcast. So I'm excited to have you on here and and thanks for for fitting in uh, some time with me today. No, thank you for having me. (laughs) This is going to be fun. Now, okay, being British, you know, I'm obviously British um, as well, but uh, many people know that I, I live in the US. You obviously knew that too. But for someone who doesn't know, maybe they're American, maybe they're Australian, um, 
who is Jake Whiteman? Tell me, tell us a little bit about you. So I run 850 on the track uh, for Great Britain. So I've been lucky enough to compete at some some big champs over the last couple of years, like Worlds last year and Europeans this year. Uh-huh. Uh, I was brought up in a running family. Both my parents were marathon runners. Um, I'm 24. I'm based in Teddington, uh, which is southwest London. And the reason for that and a lot of runners being based there is we've got two pretty beautiful parks, which yeah. are about seven miles round, Richmond and Bushy Park. So for training, it's pretty perfect. That is cool. And I've heard Joe Pavey talking a lot about how um, how amazing it is to train and live around there. So um, Yeah, Mo Farah is back down there at the moment. So it's, yeah, it's a pretty cool place to be. Oh, great. Well, thank you for sharing. And, um, you know, I met you at the European Championships in 2016, um, which, you know, has been a while now. But, um, you know, you mentioned there that your family are very involved in the running world. Um yeah. It's both being marathon runners. And I actually read as well that apparently, if this is true, you can tell me, your brother also appears sometimes as the British mascot. Uh, is that true? Yeah, no, he, he was until last year, I think. So we did it for three or four years. So there was a big blue bear called Brit Bear who they brought in. And because <laughs> my dad does a lot of the announcing at events, yeah. uh, they were looking for something to this mascot stuff for my brother, the act, which is pretty uh, pretty low on the acting spectrum of like how high you can get in it. But uh <laughs> Yeah, he did it for a little bit of cash while he was a student and then ended up doing it a bit longer. But that baton's been passed on since... Uh, not to your sister, watched. right? So. No, I don't know. So, <laughs> and not to anyone I know because the, the level's been raised since the Worlds. Okay. Last year, there was a very good mascot. So it's a bit hard to um, oh, hard to keep up. It's a competitive business now, huh? It is. I think you have to be more than just like a clown you need to be able to do flips and stuff now oh, so okay. that's well out of his ballpark that's funny okay well well that's uh, really cool to to hear and just interesting to learn about <laughs> and um okay so you mentioned marathon running yeah. do you think you'll eventually end up there or do you have absolutely no desire to ever do a marathon? <sighs> uh right now to be fair I'm, I'm mainly concentrated on keeping my events at 8 and 15 for as long as possible um the fact both my parents are marathon runners, I don't really know how I've got any fast twitch in me because they're they're both absolute donkeys when it comes to just churning out miles. So um, <laughs> one day maybe, because I feel like professionally it can prolong your career, but also it's a, it's a challenge that I think every runner should take on at some point and competitively just because everyone can relate to marathon, what time you've run and if my mm. parents can do it, then I hope that the genes are there somewhere. <laughs> so <laughs> if if you, you know, you said you'd like to do it maybe someday, but obviously want yeah. to focus on 800, 1500 right now. Yeah. Uh, does that mean you would like to someday do it competitively rather than just complete it to complete it? I think so. If my body can still put together that amount of mileage by the end of my career on a track, because I think when my time stop improving I feel like performances aren't getting any better I'd probably look to stepping up to something like that and okay I don't know I, I think most athletes dabble in it and either their first their first race doesn't go as well as they think and they shy away from it or you keep cracking through until you've got a good one but it's definitely a, a challenge I'd like to take on at some point mm-hmm. oh well I look forward to seeing that someday and uh, <laughs> right now you know you met we mentioned you you are focusing on 800 1500 so just for the listeners you've run 144 yep. in the 800 333 in the 15 and I will give a 4, uh, 354 mile just because a lot of American listeners 1500 yeah. means nothing so no, no. um for US listeners you know something like third in the Commonwealth Games or third in the European Championships, uh, just breaking it down to very basics. What do those two things mean, the Commonwealth Games, the European Championships? Uh, so the Commonwealth Games is something that in Britain is uh, pretty well known. But I realised when I went to the States last year that not many people in the US actually know what the Commonwealth is, but it's pretty much countries that used to be uh, part of the British Empire. So mm-hmm. it's a bit of a funny one because it kind of glorifies Britain's <laughs> past a bit. But competitively, the big nations are... So you got you compete for your individual nations rather than Great Britain. So England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Then you've got Canada, Australia, Kenya are probably the big ones in athletics. Um, so for me at the Commonwealth, I had the Kenyans. So it was one and two for them who were one and two in the world last year. And then myself in third. So that was my first uh, international medal as a senior. So a pretty nice moment for me. Yeah. And then Europeans at the end of the year um, came just from... Uh, just pretty much every nation in Europe if athletes qualify they can send athletes there so in theory it is the best athletes in Europe so to pick up another medal there was uh, 
was a nice way to finish a season. Yeah, you've had a you've had a great year, and uh, we're going to talk about one race, which I know people listening will will know about in a minute, but. Many of the people listening are never going to race anything shorter than a 5k um, and yeah. they might go all the way up to an ultra marathon. So yeah. we're just going to kind of go through what a 1500 or even a mile um, or even an 800 is like. So to someone listening, they might think, well, that sound, that would be pretty quote unquote easy because it's not that long. You only have to concentrate yeah. for a few minutes, but kind of I take wish. us through you know, the experience of running, uh, well, I guess we can do both like an 800, like when do you start feeling tired? Like what do you kind of have to, um, deal with in one of those races? And then we'll go on to the 1500 afterwards. Yeah. So an 800 is probably the biggest test of speed endurance. And it's, it's a pretty big balance of having good 400 meter speed and a bit of endurance leading towards 1500 and 5k. So uh, we go through the bell in around 50, 51 seconds, uh, if that, for 400, if that, uh, makes sense. So we're moving pretty quick. And for me, I don't actually run a 400 that much quicker. So lactic already starts to hit at the bell. And then it's really, it's really sort of trying to fight that feeling. And it's something you don't really get in the longer distances, but when your body fills with lactic, all your body wants to do is just shut down to a walking pace. But what you have to do in an 800 is keep fighting through. So it's getting used to running with heavy legs, heavy arms, but a completely different sort you'd get to an endurance event. Mm -hmm. So the only way I could say uh, you could probably replicate is try and run a 400 meters flat out and see what the last hundred meters of that feels like, because that's what an angel feels like the majority of the way around. (laughs) Yeah, but I can definitely attest that I hated the 800. I I (laughs) don't know how you do it, but, um, okay. So talk about, uh, you know, you said there that you you feel pretty tired even, even halfway through with one lap to go. Um, what about the first lap? Like, is there, how do you know kind of whether you want to go on the inside or, um, whether you want to try and get to the front, tell us some of the, you know, the thought processes that might go into the first lap of a race. Uh, so an 800 is pretty unique because although it's a middle distance event, you start in lanes. So, uh, you run the first hundred meters in your own lane and break after hundred meters on the back straight to come together. And uh, the majority of people try to get out hard that first hundred so that they, they can get a good position as soon as it goes because you've only got 700 minutes left after the break. So my problem is, is because I come from a 1500 background rather than 400, I'm not the quickest. So I usually get to the break, one of the last ones. And the important thing is just uh, find the position and not wasting any energy moving out or surging because in the middle distance events, any mistake you make is so much more costly just because you don't get the time or the energy uh, to rest during the race. It's just flat out pretty much from the start. So mm-hmm. uh, you have to make sure you hit the hit the bell with a lap to go with, with some running left in your legs, but at the same time, you need to make sure you've hit that quick enough or you won't run a quick time. So I like it because it's over pretty quick. And uh, yeah, it's, it's the sort of event that my body responds pretty well to, but you do have to have... Uh, some good speed, which is Mm -hmm. pretty important to work on throughout the year. Otherwise you won't be able to run a quick one. Mm -hmm. And, and from a personal kind of what I understood of, of racing the 800, you kind of get one, one gear change within the race that you can essentially use whenever will work best for you. So what about for you? When do you typically use your, your gear change? Uh, so I'm pretty, because I come from 1500 again, uh, my strength is probably in the last 200 where, a lot of the guys who are used to running 400s and 800s, they find 800 a long way, whereas I find 800 a pretty short way compared to my 1500s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my strength comes in the last 200 where people start to tie. I feel like I can stay a bit stronger than them and start picking people off. So I generally use that last 200 to, to kind of come around on the bend if I'm not going too wide um, and just pick off those guys that are starting to struggle because every race is going to be people misjudging it and mm-hmm. Once the lactic hits, you're not coming back out of it. That's your race yeah. sort of done and decided because you're just going to go backwards. So the important thing in an 800 is not to speed up, but to not slow down as much as the other people in the race. Mm-hmm. It's always run uh, sort of a, a quick race that gets slower almost. But if you can be the one slow in the least, then you'll do well. Yep. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> so when you mentioned uh, when we first started this talk about 
uh, you know, the, the lactic acid already starts building up in your legs quite yeah. early and you, you, you know, you're trying to go against that burn. Um, what yeah. do you tell yourself, you know, when you, when your, your arms and your legs are already starting to, to lock up, like, how do you, how do you keep overcoming that? Is it just doing it enough to kind of harden yourself to it? Yeah, I think uh, if you just went out and ran an 800 without having done any session specific to it, you wouldn't really be able to fight it that much. But we condition ourselves so much in sessions to to recreate that feeling and to have to run through it in reps further on in the session. Uh, it's a sort of feeling where if you're not used to it, it'll make you sick just because the lactic mm-hmm. doesn't just fill your arms and legs, it fills your stomach as well. So that's the if you're not used to that feeling, that's the usual response, which isn't a very pleasant one. Um, but I'm so competitive, so... I think in a race, I don't even notice I'm hitting that until after I'm done. And then that overwhelming feeling of, oh mm. God, I feel a bit sick here mm-hmm. comes in. Uh, and yeah, you just, you, you only see it back when you watch it or see the photos and that your face is so grimaced. And that's when you know you probably were fighting through that. But on a good day, if you judged it right, you won't notice you going through that. On a bad day, when you haven't judged it right, it'll feel like your your body weight has doubled. <laughs> and and talk about that like you know for for someone listening who th- who watches the 800 maybe in the olympics yeah. or something like that and they think oh well they all make it look easy um you yeah. have locked up yourself and and essentially walked mm-hmm. it in even though you're still trying to run yeah it's um yeah it looks effortless just because a lot of the time in championship races especially it's not run as quick as people would be otherwise so you do get people kicking on a little bit better and not hitting those sort of uh, lactic levels they would otherwise but it is just completely how conditioned you are to it so I think especially with middle distance and uh, you, you have to be so specific to running and training towards those events and then the same goes that if we tried to race 5k 10k marathon we'd be awful because I just our aerobic system wouldn't be the same so mm-hmm. it's just completely different systems that you have to work on specifically mm-hmm. and I I'm, I'm think uh the longer distance runners are probably lucky they don't deal with the the anaerobic feeling and the lactic being building up in your body. But at the same time, I'm pretty glad I don't have to feel uh, my aerobic system working as hard <laughs> because of it. <laughs> and uh, you know that's the that's the thing with running, isn't it? No matter how you go about it, you're going to have some kind of hard. It's just which one yeah. which one you choose. Okay, let's talk yeah, about the 1500 painful. instead. Uh, what yeah. what's the difference there with kind of how you feel? Walk us through a typical situation there. Uh, so 1500 is three and three quarter laps of the track. And, uh, the main thing with that is you won't be, you won't be running at a speed, which you feel is completely uncomfortable from the start or well, not uncomfortable, but you feel like you're pushing from the start. Um, so the main thing is just to feel relaxed as possible. And the, the place where most people go wrong is in the third lap, just because that's where it starts to burn a bit. And rather than the 800 where lactic kind of comes on you suddenly, the 1500 is just a slow, gradual build up And, you end up just running, especially in championships, a very quick last lap, which mm. is a hard way of running it, but that's a, the same. Uh, we train to be able to do that. So it's being able to once again run through lactic, but not the same volume that you'd experience in 800, just a slow, gradual build. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, uh, you know, the, I, I always enjoyed the 1500 because of that reason yeah. that it's not so intense. You do get to enjoy no. it for maybe a lap and then you can yeah. kind of, you know, put your head down and concentrate. But um, I have a question from uh, one of my uh, Patreon members, which is Emily wants to know um, international or realistically most men's 1500 are notoriously tactical. So how do you prepare yeah. for races like that when they're not just going to be simply a time trial? Uh, sadly, probably the best way to prepare for that is to keep racing races like that because you can't replicate the the tactics you'd use in a, in a training session. Mm-hmm. It's just about making sure you, you're pretty calm and you don't waste any energy because you'll need it all in that last lap because the 400 PBs between everybody or like all PRs, as you say in the States, will be only a couple seconds apart. So everyone can finish quick. Uh, it's just using that at the right time and making sure you haven't wasted any energy before. Mm-hmm. Uh, to get it wrong so it's a lot a lot of the time you need to make sure you've got a change of pace so that's probably the main thing you can get ready for is making sure you you do different speeds within sessions so within a rep uh, make the second half a rep quicker than the first half or even within a session just keep changing the distances so you're constantly changing your pace Um, but I think it will always be like that just because there's no pacemakers so people Mm -hmm. don't want to take a risk and run hard from the start in case they blow up and the whole field catches them so a lot of people back their finish and believe that they can 
outkick everyone on the start line, which is why you get races that look stupidly slow. But uh, I think, to be fair, I think they they look probably bad for sport because they're not as quick mm. as uh, you'd like to see. But at the same time, I think they're pretty exciting and a oh, lot yeah. more exciting than races when people go out hard. So And you probably all thrive yeah. on it, right? Being able it's it's to... nerve-wracking. Yeah. But, but yeah, if, if you think you can run like that and if you the better you get at it, the sort of more enticing it becomes for races to go like that. But if you haven't had the practice, it's pretty scary. Uh huh. And you also think you practice being able to kind of read people to tell, okay, they're getting ready to make a move. Yeah. Well, you, you kind of know what people, cause there's only, I don't know, there's probably 50 people throughout the year at a certain level who you'll race. So you've raced everybody probably at least once in the season before you get to a championship. Um, so you know what people want to do and what they'd like to do. So I guess it's looking for that and making sure you know where people are. So if someone's going to be one to to kick early, you know where they are to watch them do that. If someone's going to come late, you know where they are to watch them do that. So people tend to play it safe because you only really get one chance. So they'll they'll use uh, they'll use their strengths. So yeah. uh, you kind of get to learn what everyone's going to try and do. Yeah, it's really interesting and and kind of like you get to do your research before you you get to our yeah. championships. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah. so let's talk about um, you know going into these big races where you know anything can happen. How do you uh, prepare mentally to to give yourself the confidence to know that you can compete with the best in the world? You you yeah. mentioned yourself there that a few seconds can differentiate everyone. Yeah. Um, so how do you kind of go into it mentally? Uh, the one thing I've learned probably the last few years because I I didn't used to run that well at champs. I hadn't done too many and. I think one of the reasons was is that I was over overworking the situation a little bit. Mm. Uh, I realized that you need to just treat it as any other race in the season and just be relaxed because if you're stressed, if you're worrying about things, overthinking it, you're never going to get the best out of yourself because so much of that nervous energy you need to run well is just going to be wasted in the warm-up. So I just treat it as any other race. And I think if you know you're in good enough shape to go out and run your best, then like what's stopping you from doing that? You just have to do what you've done throughout the season. So uh, as long as everything physically has gone well, then I always give myself sort of just just the confidence to know that I can do it. So why shouldn't I? Yeah. I just have to make sure I don't do anything stupid, which is uh, what most people throw away in champs is not by other people doing really great stuff. It's mainly you doing something silly that will ruin your whole race. What would be an example of that? Uh, so sometimes I've, I've like kicked too early in a race. So gone way too soon, hit lactic, uh, with about 200 meters to go and the whole field come past me just cause I've got carried away by the whole occasion. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially when it's a, a championship final and it's like usually at night, the lights are on, it's quite intense. The crowd's going wild. There's a lot at stake, but well, what's making that any different to any other race? It's just, you, it's exactly the same distance, probably the same people. So if you've run your best by being being in a pretty good headspace and not worrying too much about the race, mm. then why shouldn't a championship final just be exactly the same? That's so true. I, I love that way of thinking. And <laughs> what do you tell yourself? Uh, well, firstly, what does your mind say when you're in a rough patch? Like maybe you're in that third lap. Do you you kind of say like, oh, this is really hard. I don't know how I could do. And then what do you tell yourself to kind of overcome that? Uh, a lot of the time I always, I always think everything you've done in training is going to be harder than a race. Like a race is the easiest bit. So if you've got through a session where you felt rubbish uh, and you've actually ended up having a good session, just remember that. And then when you come to racing, you'll know that even if you're not feeling great, you can still produce the best out of yourself. So would um, you repeat like the name of a, like a, you know, 800s last week or would you what would you say to yourself uh i just say most of the time just like I, i'd say like stay patient because it doesn't okay. nothing happens in the in especially 1500 to the last 300 so i always just say like stay relaxed and you'll find something there and every time however bad you feel you do seem to find something as long as there's nothing physically wrong it's just you're never going to always feel great uh, when you're racing and it's the same when you're going out for a run, going training, but it doesn't mean you can't find something and end up having a good run. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the same if you're warming up for something, you can often feel awful, but it doesn't mean that you're not ready to run. It's just a lot of the time it's just mind over matter and you have to stop your head from thinking these negative thoughts because it's always going to try and happen. But once you realize you can overcome that, then, uh, yeah, you should end up having some pretty consistent performances. Yeah. And, and, 
I could definitely see how that has worked for you and and for other people who are listening who maybe do struggle with um, confidence in themselves. All of what you said there was was great, and you also mentioned about um, you know staying relaxed and and there's going to be tough yeah. parts and realizing it. What would you what would your advice be to someone who does you know really struggle, particularly as you mentioned in that you know maybe the warm up, maybe the warning of yeah. they think I can't do this. I, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. Yeah, I think you've got to remember the work you've put in and how hard you've trained to sort of get to that occasion and the the racing should just literally be the icing on the cake I think Mm. and it's a great opportunity to show how hard you've worked and what sort of shape you're in so see that as an opportunity rather than something that's daunting um I don't I don't necessarily think that you need to overthink it it's just it's the reward for all the hard training is that you don't have to probably run as far as you probably run before you don't have to dig as deep sometimes it's just making sure you come there in the best mindset possible and don't let any sort of bad thoughts get the better of you. That's so true. Another thing I used to tell myself um, when I was racing was, you know, even if you're in a longer race or a shorter race, it doesn't matter. Like if you say to yourself, all the hours of pain I've spent in the last, you know, three, four months, this is nothing. Because it it isn't really. When you add up all the hours you've already put in, like you mentioned, that's, you know, one way of looking at it. And, um, you know, I thought you would yeah. have some good advice. Obviously, you're very good at dealing with pain and um, learning how to block it out. And I just thought you would have some good advice. And, and that was so thank you for that. No, I, th- I think because um, what's the point in putting all those all those miles away to, for me to throw it away in one mile for, for others to throw it away in three to throw it away in even 26. Like It's not worth it at all. So you just got to put it into perspective what the work you've done. But what about the other the other direction someone says well I've put in all these hours I can't screw it up now and they put it put pressure Uh, on yeah I I think I don't know what sort of uh everyone's different but I kind of like that sort of pressure uh in some way the expectation I think I do well under but it's making sure that that doesn't get the better of you because the only person putting pressure on you is yourself uh and if you realize that then just what's the worry about it like yeah you're the only one in control of it. No one's going to judge you for your run except mm-hmm. for yourself. So yes. you just got to be open-minded about it and, and make sure you know why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you so much. And what about someone who wants to give these shorter distances a try? Maybe they want to do a bit of a speed segment or they want to uh, train for maybe a mile race that they have planned. Um, t- walk us through a typical week of training. Um, let's do one week where you don't have a race and then we'll do yeah. a week where you do have a race. Uh, so one of the things that you probably imagine is my volume isn't as high as say if I was doing something a bit longer. So Mm-hmm. I probably average about uh, last winter was 65 miles a week with my max being 75. So a Monday, uh, I do a steady seven or eight and it would be steady is pretty quick for me. So it'd be about 545, 540. Per mile? Per mile. Wow. Yep. Okay. And and then we do yoga in the evening. Oh, um, I so we're that. pretty big. <laughs> no, like it's it's helped a lot. I think just stay oh. injury free, and it's kind of just structured stretching, which people neglect a lot of the time. So if you've got someone, we use an app, and if there's someone directing the positions to you and how long you should hold them, then it, it stops you from being lazy and cheating uh-huh. yourself. Yeah. Uh, in the winter, Tuesday we do hills, um, so they could be up to seventy five seconds, a pretty steep gradient, and then I do a strength conditioning session for about two hours. So that's. Uh, some core lifts, accessory work, and, and uh, some sort of trunk work. So the hills uh, you mentioned uh, there, what, um, you know, is it you just run up it ha- like for a certain amount of time total or a certain number of times? Uh, so I do it, we go up to about 15 reps of okay. this one hill that's 75 seconds. So okay. we'll run hard up it and then jog back down, but okay. constantly keep it moving. So okay. when you get to the top, turn and come back. Okay. All right. And then you do your strength and conditioning after that. Yeah. So that's written by an SNC coach and that's progressed quite a lot over the last few years. So I feel like I'm competent in the gym now. <laughs> um, and then Wednesdays we'll do an easier run. So that'll be about six minute mile in of about eight miles. Uh, sometimes it's a double day of about of two fives. And then I'll do a little prehab circuit. So that's just little exercises that make sure stuff doesn't twang or get too weak. So it'll be calf work, uh, hamstring work, 
bit of core, some like walking drills, stuff like that. Okay. Um, Thursday, some quicker runs again. So probably about a five mile steady. So 545, 540, and then some drills and sprints, uh, which is pretty important as a middle distance runner to maintain that speed work throughout the year. Um, Friday will be just an easy run or recovery day. Saturday will be some longer grass reps during the winter. Um, so all time based. And then a lifting session again in the evening and then a long run up to 17 miles. It was last winter mm. on a Sunday. Uh, very easy. So that's quite a long run for a middle distance yeah. runner, which is getting up a bit. And I, I hate it because I'm not, I'm not good on my time on my feet. Uh, like what yeah, is it? You, you get bored well. or what do you hate about it? Uh, so I enjoy running, running quick, which is why the steady running works for me. Mm. Uh, I, I just, I like it if I'm with a group of people I can chat to just because it makes it a bit funner. But it's just because I don't do that much mileage, I find the aerobic stuff hard. And I think after about 12, 13 miles, I start to really feel like my legs, mm-hmm. just that volume. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we go about 6.20, 6.30, which is pretty slow compared to the rest of my running. So mm-hmm. it's just, yeah, it's just a bit of a slog, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. But um so for for someone listening, um, you know, you obviously heard that um, Jake does, you know, a lot of a lot of hard sessions in a week there, and even the steady runs are, are pretty fast, even um, you know, just yeah. for his level. But that's kind of what tends to happen with the the middle distance training. You know, sixty five miles a week might sound a lot to many of you listening, but. Uh, you know, when you think about most elite marathon men, I mean, Jake, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine most men are probably around 100, 120 miles for the yeah, longer distance. So it's definitely yeah. like a lower mileage, which is why he can get away with running harder and running more often, um, you know, at that faster pace. So it is kind of a compromise. So if you do decide you want to do some of this training, keep that in mind that if you're going to run faster, you need to cut cut your mileage down a percentage like if you've run yeah. 60 miles a week as a marathoner then you probably should be going down to probably about 40 um if you're going to do some middle distance stuff um, it's taken um it's taken a few years to progress the yeah. pace down of my runs as well so i didn't start running under six minute mile until a couple of years ago and then each year it just gets gradually quicker otherwise mm-hmm. your body just uh can't deal with it so yeah. It's taken a lot of time to be able to run a bit steadier. Yeah, and and uh, um, I've been impressed with what you what you just said there. That's that's really good. Um, and what about uh, a race week? Tell us about that. Uh, race week. To be fair, uh, so in the different. summer that'll be supplemented with track stuff. Um, but I'll just usually I have the day off before a race. Okay. Uh, and then two days before I'll do some strides and just uh some drills and some light strides sorry just to get my legs turning over a little bit but a lot of athletes especially uh ones that I know who who compete at a pretty high level usually have two days before off and then do a little bit of uh pre-race stuff the day before so some drills and strides just because that's how they feel better but I feel pretty good resting the day before so it's just how you feel Mm -hmm. Uh, your body will wake up best on the day. So I, I have a little shake out on the morning of a race to get my legs waking up, which I always think helps just to go out for two miles really easy, just to make sure it's not a shock when I start warming up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, most races in for the 1500 and the eight are going to be in the evening or in the afternoon sometime, as you yeah. mentioned, doing a shake out of some kind. For someone who maybe has an evening race coming up, what are your suggestions with eating? Because a lot of people listening are going to have morning races, particularly in the US. They start at 7 a.m. or somewhere around there. So they're not used to kind of eating a few times before they race. What would be your suggestion with that? Uh, I'd say start with probably practice uh, doing a training session or something in the evening and practice your eating routine beforehand so that it's not new when you start it on on the race day. But I try and keep my meals three hours apart. Um, so, and I wouldn't eat more than three meals. Uh, so just make sure it's light and try not to make anything like too, too much sauce or anything that might upset your stomach. So I'd usually go for some porridge, uh, in the morning, uh, for lunch, I just have some, uh, like rice, uh, plain meat and some veg. And then my snack before I usually just have you know, butter on a bagel, but that's all usually spaced out. So no more than, no less than three hours before what I eat, before I race. Okay. And then those other meals would probably come three or four hours in between. So 
just make sure you never feel hungry, but make sure at the same time you're not overeating because that'll start to come back on you. Yeah. Um, so just plan it out and trial it before because the worst thing is if your stomach doesn't feel great because you've got your eating plan wrong, yeah. um, which could like ruin your whole race. Yeah, great advice. Thank you. And how about, you know, as a 1500, 800 guy, you can race often. You know, sometimes you're racing weekend yeah. after weekend, sometimes even uh, more than one race a week. Um, what are the, what are some of the upsides and some of the downsides in your opinion of being able to race often? I think, uh, probably the biggest upside is if you have a bad one, there's not long to wait until you get to redeem that and try again. So, uh, rather than like being in a huff and being upset that you've run badly, you can pretty much straight away turn your focus to something that won't be more than a week, two weeks away. Um, which is good. Uh, the downside is probably that. There's periods throughout uh, throughout the season where you do get tired and you do start to get little niggles because it's it's pretty straining on the body running middle distance because you're running you're running pretty quick so little muscles start to get tired and uh, when you change pace you might tweak a tendon or something like that and you're constantly managing something throughout the season uh, so the more races that come up the sort of less likely that is to be completely healed. Um, which I guess that's the way it is. And the racing season for us is only three or four months. Um, so you can deal with it and we train to be able to deal with that whole season. Uh, but yeah, there, there are, there are many plus sides to it, which I, I like racing. So I'm glad it comes around often. Um, and in the winter, I sort of feel like I, I miss out when I don't have periods of racing just cause that's what we do the sport for. Mm-hmm. And so what would a, a typical year you mentioned there's a three to four month, um, racing season, which, yeah. uh, firstly, when does that run? And then secondly, what would happen the rest of the year? Uh, so the actual outdoor track season, uh, usually runs from about May until August, late August, early September. Um, if you're really hanging on to the end, but the champs are usually, uh, start of August, um, before that, we've got indoors, which usually runs from about January to the champs in March. Uh, and then pre-Christmas, I do cross country, but our cross country in Britain is very different to US cross country. We don't have yes. nicely watered golf courses and uh, really good underfoot conditions. We have proper muddy bogs uh, going up hills, falling over in the mud and just generally being freezing cold. <laughs> Yeah, and I actually do really miss English cross country because it was just it was such a mess. Like um, I can't even. I mean, people listening, if you haven't seen a, a European cross country race, you should Google it or look it up because it's just yeah. you know you might end up with mud splattered all over your face. You know, you you yeah. might get mud in your mouth. You um, there's, uh, there's most just, of the time you, you come out completely covered, don't you? And it yeah. just stick it sticks to you for the rest of the day. And it's, yeah. You can sometimes feel like you're hyperthermic, even though you just run like eight k. Yeah, so it's I've, yeah, um, it's horrible. I, I've I've told this story before, but I actually once lost a shoe at Nottingham, and I went really? back to go find it after the race, and it was buried again. That's how, and I just use that as an example. That's how thick this mud in is, and it's like that, like sucks your yeah. shoe off. And I could not find of- my shoe again. So it that tells you how muddy I'm talking. We're talking here. Most people would uh, take their spikes, wouldn't they, in in like European races because the fear of that happening. I don't know if you did, and it still. Got I did. You. I did after that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get like duct tape, and you kind of wrap it around your your laces, and kind of sometimes up to your ankles, just to make sure that it really is secured on well. So, cross country yeah. in uh, Europe, if if you ever get the opportunity to do it, go do it because it is. Yeah. It is uh, it's hard, horrible. but it's <laughs> um, it's so much fun at the same time. So I miss it yeah. a lot. Um, all right. Okay. Let's talk about, um, this year you won the new balance fifth Avenue mile. Um, yeah. before you came over here to do that race, did you realize how big of an, an event that actually was here in the U S? Uh, so I've raced it, uh, 2016 and 2017. And okay, so you have. I think there's a lot of history behind it and you see the guys winning it are always pretty big names. And I think, uh, British, there's not been too many athletes that have won it, but it's been a lot of athletes come over and race it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just they load the field so uh, I feel like you're competing against 20 guys who are all know how much that race means and are all within about five seconds of each other time wise so it's one that's been around for a long time and I think the fact it's uh, 
down Fifth Avenue, which is like, such a cool street, uh, makes it one that I've always really wanted to win. Yeah. And tell us about that this year. Like, was there a point you thought you had it in the bag or it was Nick Willis, right? Who was running yeah. right up, up to the line with you. Like, tell us about um, kind of how you felt in that race. Uh, I hadn't actually won a race outside of heats of champs but before that. And it was the last race of the season. So I was pretty set on trying to win it because I felt like I'd learned a couple of years before how to win it. And it's a straight mile. So you can see the finish line from probably like 600 meters out. You can see it and it's just slowly coming closer, but it comes at such a slow rate that you can misjudge it so easily, which is what I did before. Um, Nick had won it the year, the previous year. So I knew it was going to be hard to beat because he, he knows exactly how to win that race. So I felt like I was, um, I was in good enough shape to do it. I just needed to judge my effort. And there was a point in the race where you kind of get an instinct as to when you feel like you should go because it's starting to wind up and you feel, feel good. So you need to capitalize on that. And I think I went with probably about just outside 200 meters to go. And Nick came trying to Mm. come past me and, uh, I managed to find a sixth gear, which is pretty important in middle distance running to find another kick. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was such a wet day, but that didn't stop it. The crowd was still great. And it was, yeah, I feel really lucky to have won that. Yeah, that, it was really cool to see it. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about the seeing the finish line from such a long way away. Is that a good or a bad thing? I mean, uh, obviously it can be both, but tell us about, you know, for someone who's never raced a, a straight race like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend if you've never had the chance to do a, a road mile, I'd highly recommend it just because it's good fun uh, and it's a real test of uh, like speed endurance and something you wouldn't feel during a marathon, like I was saying before, or like another long distance race. Um, but yeah, you can you kind of just have to ignore how far away it is and just uh-huh. keep looking at the markers that come. So there's splits for every 400 meters and. I use that to gauge. You just have to imagine it's like a track because we're so used to racing on that, that uh-huh. if you know that you've got a lap to go, then you're not going to go uh, too soon. And you're going to know uh, pretty much where 200 is because mm-hmm. it's going to be halfway between that marker and the finish. So mm-hmm. it's deceptive because it's always, it's always trying to trigger you to go too soon, mm-hmm. but you just have to be so patient and sort of not react to other people's moves. If you think that they've gone too soon and just stick to your sort of race plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, right to wrap up here, we got one more thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is that you really like to give back to the community. I've seen pictures of you helping with park runs, uh, <laughs> working at the young athlete camp at St Mary's. Um, which uh, did you go to that yourself when you were younger? Uh, I actually wasn't good enough to go, uh, oh. so they take the top. I think is it the top uh, thirty or something like yeah. that? Uh, Twenty yeah. athletes in in the country at uh, each age group, and yeah, I wasn't one of them, so I didn't get the chance to go. How does that feel now, knowing that you're like, how you missed out on me? I could have. <laughs> no, well, I, I still think you've got a head up by being there. And I try and say that to the, the kids that go is that like, it doesn't matter if you're not the best one on this camp. The fact you've made that camp, you're already in a better position than I was. So mm-hmm. you just have to keep your head with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember feeling so inspired after leaving leaving that camp that I just like I remember going home the first run after that camp. And I was like, yeah. I'm going to do this. So, you crushed yeah. it probably didn't you? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that probably thought I was <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, no it's a real it's really good to have stuff like that yeah yeah and and just for anyone listening so um in Britain every uh summer I think it is they have a oh. young athlete camp when I think it was about five days is that right yeah um, yeah, it's, and you go it's... to the camp and, uh, you know, you obviously are training with all the other best athletes in the country and you do, you know, sessions or workouts together and, um, you learn about different aspects as guest yeah. speakers. I remember Craig, Craig Mottram was the one who came when you I was You had there. a good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, it's just really, it's, it's just a great thing that, um, is it British athletics that do it or? Uh, so it's London marathon. So okay. you kind of like. I think it's kind of like a stamp of approval if you go because mm. you're acknowledged as being that good uh, at the point. So you can kind of tell by, from my perspective, when you go to camps like that and you see kids in a big group, uh, you can tell the ones that are probably gone to do mm. pretty well because they're the ones that are fully engaged, listening. There's this like a big tendency for kids when they go to stuff like that just to get uh, carried away and just treat it more like a fun camp yeah. rather than actually like take away the good stuff that's been given because yeah. they're so lucky to have an opportunity like that so I feel like most are there to to take away from that and hope 
will be inspired to go and mm-hmm. stick in the sport and progress through it. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, so why do you feel that it's important to give back to the community? Why does that mean a lot to you? Uh, I always think what, to start with, what I would have liked if if I was young. So like from that young athletes one, I'd think like if there was someone who'd been there and done it, I would have been on the edge of every word they'd said and been listening for like words of inspiration. But I also think that uh, athletics and running is a pretty strong, tight-knit community and I think it's nice to give back to grassroots because everyone has to come through that at some point and you're not really that far away from it ever because you can come from being just a club athlete or doing local races to all of a sudden the next year doing international races like you can break through the sport pretty quick mm-hmm. um, but it's also it's it's nice to to try and like boost the profile of the sport because it gets a lot of bad press athletics yeah, especially the track stuff with oh, especially over the last few years as well so it's nice to try and be a good role model uh, to the public and show that the sport isn't as bad as people think. And it's mm-hmm. actually like a pretty good one to follow. And I think probably one of the best sports in the world, Well, for me, the best sport in the world and <laughs> one that is pure competition. So I don't see what there's not to like about it. Yeah. And, and I love that you, you do give back and, and thank you for doing that and inspiring That's other people. Right. Cause I know it does help. Um, so what, so. on that note, just to finish off here, what do you wish someone would have told you as a younger runner when you were, you know, 15, 16? Uh, to be honest, I, I was pretty lucky that because both my parents ran, I, mm. I was always given the right advice. And the one thing that I was told, which uh, a lot of a lot of kids I saw drop out of the sport probably weren't, is that like literally it's just a game of being patient and you're never going to have success the whole way through. So mm. the majority of people uh, have a couple of bad years with injury or growing, whatever reasons. And they sort of think that their chance in the sport are gone, but you've got to look at people like Mo Farah who broke through when they were uh, in their late twenties. Like if you don't persevere and keep plugging away at the sport, you won't get what you put out of it. But I can guarantee that if you stay with it and don't do anything stupid or lose your head or lose your love for the sport, you will get the success you you deserve from all the hard work you put in. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be applied at every level. It's not, you know, yeah. obviously Jake is um, experienced with kind of getting to the very top level. And we're not saying that anyone listening can suddenly run for their country, but, um, you know, you might get it in your level. Maybe you have some kind of big lifetime goal that you have. I know a lot of people, it's a yeah. Boston qualifier. Uh, just because yeah. you don't get it in the first year or the second year, even the third year, doesn't mean you won't get there and Jake's words can definitely be applied uh, across the board for all of us so hope you took that in there Um, okay we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the running for all four you obviously love podcasts right you wouldn't be here otherwise and as this is a bonus episode I wanted to let you know about something else I have related to podcasts if you love podcasts you might enjoy my running for real podcast series now I have six different series I'm going to tell you a little bit about each in just a second but what are these these series are six to seven episodes about a specific topic that you might be interested in and they have some of the best experts from all over the world who are here to give you specific advice on these topics. Along with that, you get a 15 to 20 page printout guide that you can use and it has referrals from people, it has suggestions, it has tips from these experts that are not included in the interview. I bugged the heck out of them to make sure they gave me good advice. And if you haven't already checked out the podcast series, if you are a newer listener, or if you are someone who just got a little bit busy when it came time to uh, check these out earlier in the year, I just wanted to remind you about them. So I do have a beginner runner podcast series, a coming back from injury. So that one is especially important if you are struggling with an injury, especially as we focus on the emotional and the mental side of injuries. On that note, I have a mental training series. If you are preparing for a race and the mental side of your running is what kind of holds you back, definitely want to be checking that one out. There is a nutrition podcast series where we kind of look into all the different viewpoints of people who are experts in the industry so you can make your own mind up about what is the best nutritional path for you. There is a marathon podcast series. I don't have to explain that one. I think you kind of get what that one is. And uh, finally, there is a running through and after pregnancy podcast series. If you are thinking about getting pregnant 
or if you are pregnant or even if you're postpartum, this is really going to help you. I get all the answers to all the questions. Now, on that note, I made sure each of these episodes are focused on a specific topic within that category. Really, really detailed. I'm really proud of these series. Price them way too low, so you're going to get them at steel, and I cannot guarantee they're always going to be at the price they are right now. So head on over to tinamuir.com and head to the podcast tab. You will see them right there. Hope you enjoy. Thanks so much. All right, Jake, four more questions for you, starting with, I hope you look these up. I did send you an email. Yeah, yeah, I saw them on the email, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Um, Tell us about a photo of you that maybe is on your social media, maybe not, uh, that isn't quite what it seems. Uh, So one, it's actually a video that's on my Instagram, but it's in South Africa doing some hurdle bounds. Uh, So that's, yeah, uh, just some hops over the hurdles, but with quite a lot of force and trying to go pretty high, but... My shins were actually hurting every single step of that and I shouldn't have really been doing them. <laughs> but the thing I was going to say from it is that I think all throughout the year, uh, every athlete, every level is probably nursing some sort of injury. So I think if you think you've got it hard, then like there's probably somebody in a worse situation. And if not, people are trying to hide it a bit better. So you just have to make sure you know exactly what you can and can't do and uh, and manage it because there's nothing worse than having a problem that you think is going to um, it's going to go away on its own. It doesn't. You just have to be responsive and don't do stupid stuff like that where <laughs> it looks good, but it definitely wasn't helping at the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for being honest and sharing that with us. What about <laughs> right. uh, a running for real moment, something that only runners will understand? Uh, so I would say uh, that although it seems like, especially at, the level that I run at and people around me that we live the strictest lives possible. We're all so human. So every runner will have temptations that you have to give in to now and then. So you're not always going to be able to keep your diet as strict as you want. You're not always going to be able to uh, stay, stay off alcohol. If that's what, uh, if you feel like having a drink, like you need to just moderate everything. So I would treat, have like some bad food every now and then just to make sure that I don't go mad for it. Cause mm-hmm. otherwise it would just, Otherwise, it just builds up and builds up and you'd explode. So I think uh, every level of running, people people need to live like that. So don't be obsessive over sort of being strict on yourself and taking these things that you think are bad out because eventually you'll implode. We all need to treat ourselves every now and then. So just make sure everything's in moderation and yeah. you're not going obsessive over stuff. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, life is for living at the end of the day. So you don't want to be yeah. removing everything that you enjoy eating just for the sake of um, something that is going to make you miserable overall because you're spending yeah. 23 of your 24 hours a day not enjoying it. So thank you. That's yeah. that's helpful. I, what about a high moment sorry. for you in your running career? Uh, so my dad is a stadium announcer and um, he does most of the big champs. So he did London 2012, the Olympics. He's done uh, most of the British Grand Prix, but he also did Commonwealths. So... Mm. He called my race where I won Aww. a bronze medal uh, and someone got it on video actually, but that's a pretty special moment because I haven't actually had that many races where I've run really well while he's been announcing. So to medal while he was calling it in, I think was a that's pretty true. special moment for both of us. Did he have to maintain his composure or could he get really excited? Yeah, he's stone cold Steve. So he kept his composure, but <laughs> the only emotion, I think it's on his Instagram. So he's Jeff Whiteman uh, okay. on Insta and his, uh, the video is just him calling it which someone's filming and then uh, someone pats him on the back and he just does a little nod to them and that's it. <laughs> and then he gets back to the job. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to have that because uh, I know that he's at every race and if I can run well while he's there, then it makes it even better. Yeah, that is. That's great. Thank you so much. All right. And finally, what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line of a race? Uh, I just tell myself to, to sort of relax and uh, back myself really just believe believe in what I think I can do because there's no reason why the training leading up doesn't suggest that that's the form if not better you're in so just go out there and show it because mm-hmm. uh, every race is an opportunity to sort of better yourself like yeah. to run well to try and win races so you got to take everyone because they don't come around often yeah 
Thank you. That's great. All right. So you are sponsored by New Balance. I will put links in the show notes um, for any products that you particularly love for anyone to go check out if they are interested. Um, But where else can people find out more about you? Uh, So social media, I've got uh, at Jake S. Whiteman, W-I-G-H-T-M-A-N. Uh, is my face is my Twitter and my Instagram. Uh, I'm trying to launch a website soon, but I try and keep everyone as updated as I can through that. But uh, I need to get a bit better, so I try and uh, try and post as much as I can. <laughs> well, I'm sure they will enjoy following, even even if it is just a limited amount. So um, I will put links in the show notes for those as well if you want to go find them there. Jake, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, for helping us to learn about it, and just uh, you know being honest and real with us. So thanks for being here. No, thank you very much, Tina. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. I know to most of us, the 800 and the 1500 might feel like a sprint. And in many ways it is. But actually adding some speed into your training, no matter what your next goal race, might actually be what you need. Yes, even if you are training for a marathon and you really want something important. Steve and I have always made sure to do a few months of speed work before we start a marathon training segment, and I'm sure you'll benefit from this too if you give it a try. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Jake. I love how actionable his advice was and how he shared some really good suggestions on how we can get more confidence going into races ourselves. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 85. And again, I want to thank my Patreon members for making this bonus podcast episode possible. You can show how much you appreciate the hard work I put into Running For Real by going to patreon.com forward slash running for real. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash running for real with the number four. If supporting me on Patreon just isn't in the budget for you right now, the next best thing you can do is subscribe on whatever podcast player you use and leave me a rating and review on iTunes. Thank you so much in advance. On Friday, you're going to hear from my dear friend, Sarah Crouch. Sarah has had a wild ride this year, uh, running two PRs after four years of absolutely none. She also had a tumor removed from her leg just days before the Chicago Marathon, where she ended up finishing first American. If you don't already love Sarah, you will after this. Trust me. I'll see you on Friday. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.